Hello, everyone. This is Enzo with the Race Driver Coach Show, and this one is an interview. It's an interview with with me, which sounds a bit self-obsessed, doesn't it? Well, basically, what happened is Belinda Risley of Motivate Training said, I've reached my 100th episode of the podcast. Well done. It's hard to get to your 100. How many people out there have recorded podcasts and only got to 10 before they've given up? 100 so well done belinda and she said for it we should do an interview because we're aligned she teaches the vital skills that you need to succeed at a race dri- as a race driver and so do i so you can imagine i'm really into her content and she's into mine so we're on the same cause really the same mission so it was my pleasure to do this interview of course matt Payne also joins us so i think you can take a lot from this there's a little bit about you know enzo how did you get started But really, it's a conversation about drivers and performing and succeeding. So I think you will enjoy this. Hi, guys, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Motorsport Coaching Podcast, Matt. We made it. <laughs> yeah, we've got the century up. Fantastic stuff. And it's a uh, credit to you, Belinda, um, as we're saying off air, that uh, to get to 100 is a litmus test. And uh, we've made it. We've got the century. Raise the bat. Amazing. Absolutely yes. amazing. Well done. Thanks, Enzo. Enzo, for our 100th episode, I couldn't think of a better guest than race car performer, driver, coach, performance. Everything, he's the man that comes with it all. He has the same values as me as when it comes to developing drivers. Welcome, Anto. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. What time is it where you are? It is 7 p.m. Nice one. That's good. That's dedication. And that's what it takes to get to 100 episodes as well. So, yeah, brilliant. And I think that's the thing I love about you, Anto. I am a big fan and it's like it's either... Do it or don't. I don't yeah. care. If you want to be there, just do it. <laughs> no dabbling. Yeah, there's no great area for you. I love it. I love it. I yeah. love it. A lot. Exactly. I would love to hear more about you. How did you get started in motorsports? Oh, crikey. Um, obviously watching F1, like most people do when they're a kid, uh, and it's your dad that watches it. And my dad, was uh, he wasn't in motorsport at all. He was just a... Uh, uh, an Italian farmer that came to England when he was 18 and opened a pizza shop. His name was Mario, is Mario. So he's typical Italian, uh, got the moustache and everything. Um, so he was watching motorsport, uh, F1, and that sort of tickled my fancy in my early teens, I'd say. But up to yeah. that point, anything motorized, I was in there. I loved cars. I loved going on the quads at the uh, Sunday markets and things like this so always that kind of thing really got me and uh, indoor karting but then when i got to sort of end of school so say 16 years old i think it was a little bit more than that it, it really the bug really bit and it was like i want to be an f1 driver and it was all <laughs> i cared about then you start to see on the walls obviously everything changes all the posters you put up of your new um idols mansell centers people like that um and I went and got my license in 94, so some time ago now, um, at Donington, but I couldn't afford to race. So it took about two years after that before I'd saved all the money to buy a Formula Ford, even got a little cheeky bank loan, um, and did a, a club racing championship in England, and that was in 96, yeah, 96, 97. Uh, won that in the second year. So then I was on the race driver kind of trajectory to start with. And then about two years after that, I started just to coach, just to make a living, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started to coach gentlemen drivers and race schools. I worked at race schools for about 10 years or so. But in that time, pretty early on, I was more into um, self-development. You know, how can I perform better? Because the coaches I had back then were always on mindset. And I was like, I could see what a difference it was making for my driving. Mm -hmm. I used to get really nervous before getting into the car. So I had to handle that. And then it was like amazing. It's just like uh, opening a new um, sort of reality, really, seeing, God, the mind is really powerful. And since then, it's been a fascination. I became a life coach and um, mental coach after that whilst I was racing. And then I got more of a kick out of coaching other people. Mm -hmm. And it was outside and different sports and things, outside of motorsport. And then around 2004 i sort of merged the two 
and it was coaching race drivers. Um, I worked for BMW and I was the European coach for them. And I worked for driver um, F1 driver academies and programs doing the same kind of thing. Um, and then it's just built from there, really, and coaching on my own with drivers and things. So it, it started as racing, to put it short. Uh, yes. It started as me racing, but then the fascination of self-development took me into that. And it quickly replaced being in the cockpit because I think you just get a bigger kick helping other people and it sounds yeah. strange but I was I'm better at that as well than the driving <laughs> I fully get it. it so I can't drive but I get the off track <laughs> yeah so I, guess, I guess that's the key to it is that when you see the results of what you've done uh come to fruition with the driver um yeah. it's in, internally incredibly rewarding and having a look at your website you've dealt with companies like Petronas BMW yeah. Mercedes as you say um yeah. Renault which is now Alpine um this comes yeah. the day after Alpine gets a win in the Hungarian Grand Prix so tell us about some of the people that you've uh that you've worked with through those programs well Ocon was one of them um I I spent time with him in his first couple of years of driving cars and that um, seems to be the sweet spot for where I am, really. It's when they come to cars and they're trying to get on this F1 uh, trajectory, obviously. It's teaching them the skills they need. So on that program that was with Gravity, which was basically Lotus F1 Junior program, it was Esteban was one of the last drivers we did, but we also worked with Grosjean was one of our drivers, Tom Bay, Marco Whitman, who's in uh, DTM, Christian Vitoris, who was in DTM and F2. So we had quite a lot of um, drivers. Kevin Corgis, uh, Stanaway was obviously one of them, which you might know very well. Sure. Um, so yeah, it was, and Brendan Hartley for a little bit. So they're the kind of drivers I work with there, but also in BMW, it was um, a whole host Sandbird and people like this as well. So it's when you work in that industry or that area of, of the industry, you can't help but rub shoulders with some of these kids that make it all the way. Uh, did only did we only did one day with Max Verstappen, but that was in karting, and you could see straight away how special that kid was. Um, but yeah, it's it's and now it's with Liam Lawson. And uh, yes, I'm Ali, Ali. we'll claim him right now. Sorry to say, <laughs> I just got off a call from him actually. That's why I was about a minute late. Yeah. Um, and um, Ali Behrman and Ali Gray. So there's, there's like, these are the new breed now that are coming up, and it is yeah, there it's so. There's a bit too many to mention, to be fair. But it's, sure. when you're working for programs and things, you do get the luxury of uh, spending time with these guys. And what what are the, some of the specifics that you kind of work through in these programs with these guys, particularly those making that transition um, to car racing? Well, everyone's different. Because I'll tell you what, with race drivers, it's like any sports person. They come with natural skills that pretty much put them within the top 10 straight away. But you can have one driver who doesn't have the confidence, one another driver who can do it in testing but can't do it in qualifying. You've got another one who needs to lead the team a bit better because they're a bit shy outside the car. Um, some might just need general driver coaching um, and you have to hammer on them. So it, it really depends on you, you, you kind of look at the spectrum of what it takes to succeed. And at certain ages, they've got different things to focus on. Obviously, now Liam's going into DTM and stuff. He's now all of a sudden had to grown up, grow up, and he's working with adults, and his teammates can be in their thirties and things like this. So it's a completely different way you approach it compared to F two, which is younger and more. You know, um, it, it's it's like a, a razor sharp samurai sword <laughs> compared to a more uh, steak knife when you go into DTM. It's different, different thing, but that means you need different skills. And they don't talk about the driving anymore. You're talking about uh, car development and things like this. So it really depends on where they're at. But normally it's creating the kind of person that can perform on demand, that is marketable, because that helps, obviously, as you know, because uh, that's quite big. You can be fast, but if nobody really cares about you, then it's hard to make a career. So it, it's, it's so wide what you have to teach them. Like you say, with the psychology, the nutrition, uh, the marketing, all the things that you do. It's like people can see that as being arts very wide, but actually that's what they need to be good at. That's right. And sometimes they're good already on their own, so you don't need to pay attention too much there. So you go to the other area. But what I've found with everybody, and it's in every sport, is the mental side is the bit. It's them having confidence. It's them being able to perform on demand. 
that seems to be the number one for me. Um, and if you develop the whole thing around that, the rest of it sorts itself out eventually. And if you make sure that they go into every race weekend in a structured way. So, okay, what have we learned from the last time out? Obviously, uh, what are the most important things? So we just one or two things that we take through to the next race weekend. And that's our only goal. We don't think about results. It's just, I'm going to execute on the first lap in, in the race, say, say that's all they care about. Okay. That's all we're going to do this weekend. Everything else will be the same. So yeah, it's quite wide. And so it's really hard to move places in the world of motorsports. Uh, obviously you weren't born and bred into it. Like a yeah. lot of people are, um, yeah. how were you able to open doors and, and to get into all of those fantastic brands that you've had those opportunities to work with? Do you know, I think it's, uh, <laughs> Brilliant question, by the way. A really cool question. Um, if you try and reverse engineer it, it's it's um, it's just making sure you do a good job and talk to enough people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, is, uh, yeah. I mean, I would yeah. never have known it was going to go where it's gone. I was just this kid who had it was from a, a council estate, working class. Had you know, I was delivering pizzas, working in the factory. So I'm not from this industry at all. But you do good on the track you self-promote yourself i mean i was calling up pr companies saying you know i want you to work for me i can't pay you <laughs> but I'll get you, some clients. I'll get you some clients and then that will more than enough pay for the little bit of work i want uh, yeah. race teams i just used to say i haven't got the money but i'll win so i was just really cocky <laughs> and then when you do get an opportunity you gotta bloody do good obviously um yeah. and then yeah just doing that over a decade or two decades you just find your way don't you but I think, I think that's the might... big thing. It's being patient. And they're working. Drivers some, aren't, yeah. They want it now. Yes. You made some tremendous points there about the off um, the off track stuff in, in that you can be the fastest driver in the world. But yeah. if you get in front of a camera and you can't speak or you go to a sponsor and you can't actually um, come up with some talking points outside of racing or even so yourself, then yeah. you've got massive drama. So pretty much it's about... I generally say it's 75 to 80 percent off track about 20 percent on track it is it's your perception it's no different to a company um sometimes a company the product is all right but they're still the biggest company in the world you know what i mean if you've got a good product and you market well then yeah you're an apple that's fine but that's that's the ultimate um that's when you see these world champions that are there's only probably one every 10 years right i think we've probably got two at the minute but normally it's one every 10 years or so and that's what it takes but it's 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 you've got to communicate with people um because a lap time's a lap time if i if you've got a driver that's two tenths slower but he's got four hundred thousand followers or he's really good at leading the team or he's really good at engineering the car this is kind of like kimmy raikkonen really yeah he, i was just him and yeah <laughs> absolute genius when he's talking about setting up a car it will come in and tell the engineers what to put on it and that's so valuable and everyone else can't really see that so he's not as quick as he used to be but it's now there's more to it if it was just that then he would have been ousted a long time ago you know they deliver more um and yeah outside things that's where the champions really made really not just turning a good lap time I think um, I think we're seeing that currently uh, with Sebastian Vettel. I mean, yeah. um, if you look at the stuff that he's done this year, um, certainly being part of that Aston Martin Cognizant team uh, this year is really giving him a different focus. I think they've got a very different outlook to the world um, yeah. by some of the people that they've got involved there compared to when he was under the Red Bull banner and helmet Marco. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing a completely different dude. I mean, you look at what he did at the British Grand Prix, when he goes up and he starts cleaning the fans' rubbish out, <laughs> yeah. um, then, you know, he gets involved in uh, this controversy the last 24 hours where we race as one, but we don't race as that one, but we yeah. race as one anyway. Like, um, you know, it's stuff like that that, um, you know, you look at, look at Vettel, like you could he did come across at times, I've always liked Vettel, but um, certainly being up against the Aussies, he came across at times as uh, being an arrogant um, German yeah. sort of guy. But I think that... He was a product of his environment and i think now we're seeing the real guy come through yeah i mean i remember him, him uh, in bmw days when he was racing for the bmw f1 team and he used to come and see because i ran the uh scholarship that bmw had so we had about eight drivers that are in formula bmw 
all wearing the same colors all their cars were all the same colors and they were part of a, an academy where they got taught you know did fitness training and i was just running that and coaching them on that and he used to come and see us and give a little speech to the drivers and he was hilarious absolutely <laughs> hilarious he's got the same kind of british um sense of humor but he used to give his time to come half an hour and sit on the stage and talk to them all every single weekend pretty much and i was wow. like that kid's cool i like him a yeah. lot he didn't need to do it and the way he talked is brilliant but that's the problem with public perception um we only get to see snapshots we get to see them at their worst and best and we can judge people so quickly it's not until you work with them that you start to understand oh, i can see why you're staying around for 20 years now it makes sense all the people that are saying yes to the career it's like yes we'll give you the drive or yes you're coming to this position they're seeing stuff that the public aren't and it's and it's a shame i mean netflix can show it a little bit through yeah. their program but it, even they don't no one really you don't know till you're there and it's surprising actually how these so-called warriors um that are on in the car that we see how vulnerable they are the kind of political things that go on behind the scenes that so say if you're you're a teammate to somebody in a team obviously and you're three tenths off the whole season but you know that you haven't got the update that they have but you're not allowed to tell the public it's all this stuff that goes behind you know you've got team pol uh, politics happening in the background that forces you to take a back seat and you can't say you still got to smile there's so much that goes on yeah so yeah from the outside we don't really get the proper it's same with everything in life right people take a look at you or me or just have a snap judgment but they ain't got a clue what's going on and why and all this so yeah it's if they're staying around for a long time there's a reason it's the outside stuff yeah and one of the things that um well how i got to know you was through your podcast mm -hmm. um and that's a nice trail into our social media aspect and yeah. so you love social media or what are your thoughts around the social media for athletes and, and oh, do you yeah. think platform yeah. for it's the new tv right it's important because if if you spout i think i think it was the last one i did was social media actually the last um show last week and yeah. it's when you get off the plane i said you get off the plane you see everybody's on this um <laughs> and it's it's literally nine out of ten people are on it right and you're thinking to yourself okay what are they looking at and you look over the shoulder and it's always social media they're always scrolling after that it's probably emails and messages and things uh but really just it's just like a habit going to social media and it makes you realize okay if that's where all the eyeballs are and you're trying to sell yourself as a brand which a racing driver is then you've got to be present there really and so it's like it's it's free as well to promote yourself yeah even though people complain about oh it's not really good anymore you can't do this it's actually free promotion we never had that before in life companies are spending a tenth on their advertising and getting double the hit that they'd get on a, a a tv advert so it's like that's for me it's essential you've got to be on all the platforms whether it's written whether it's video or voice or whatever if you're trying to promote yourself that is um yep. and sending your message out there so i think it's really important for race drivers and i've got a few drivers now three or four that have actually got race seats or big sponsorship deals or sponsorship product um supply in just because they've got a lot of followers so it's opening up it's giving them an income stream and some of them are on twitch nowadays which is obviously just you streaming on a video game yeah and they're making thousands a week massive. yeah it's massive. ridiculous You're like how the hell <laughs> you can just create money now but people are loving it they're providing well, value back for in the day <laughs> sorry where was this back in the day <laughs> i know yeah now it's like there's no excuse to not earn cash yeah and so do you with your podcast just film on youtube and then repurpose across the platforms or do you have yeah. different content for each of the platforms i do i kind of speak uh to linkedin a little bit different so it'd be a mm -hmm. bit more of a this is a business lesson that we can take from but yeah. normally it's just it's youtube and then i'll take clips from that so i record it post it up on youtube take clips and put it around uh but yeah i'd say youtube's number one for me and then instagram and then instagram's linked to facebook so it pretty much goes there as well i think twitter's last at the minute on my priority yeah. TikTok's another one that's coming up um but they've all got different obviously you have to shoot it in this uh 
portrait or landscape or you can only have one minute over yeah. here so it becomes a full-time job as you know <laughs> and advice for those drivers that are introverts and matt spoke before about them having to speak in front of the media obviously during video for social media content as well um yeah. with the mindset training obviously it's a big part of it yeah. and do you have any advice for those kind of drivers well number one realize that it, it's essential if people haven't heard of you they won't pick up the phone to offer you a drive because you just can't you can't really peacock uh in this sport very well um when you're on a grid of 30 it's so hard to stand out unless you're winning and if you're not winning then you've got to be a profile elsewhere so speak and if you're not really injecting emotion in people that are watching you they'll switch off and they just don't really care about you but that's just the way it is and every big sports person i'd say was a personality or well, sorry every up a bit of a a why thing most of them like you think of the muhammad ali's that and even conor mcgregor it's their mouth that sort of puts them on the pedestal yeah and then they back it up with their skills obviously but if they were just quiet introverted were pretty damn good at boxing they wouldn't be anywhere near the person they would they were so you that think say something doesn't it and you don't have to think about oh what can i create today it's it's literally just document what you're doing today i'm going to the gym it's boring as hell but at least it's something you know i yeah. just had a i just had a sponsorship meeting and it went it bombed completely i said the wrong thing i was nervous you know if someone put that up that would really you know people would be engaged in the journey then so you just mm -hmm. doc it's like a video diary that's online i think if you do that that can be a nice way of doing it and just photos it doesn't have to be video if you don't think you're very yeah, good video, what, fine yeah and that's what i always encourage sorry Matt, that's why i always encourage like for those drivers that even they can just be the voice over to start off yeah. with and yeah. having those still images or having the video oh it, this is me at the gym that's yeah. my bench press that i'm going to do 20 kilos or i have done yeah. 20 kilos yeah. like just trying to to improve their confidence i mean video. everyone's obviously different do you think that for um the drivers that we've just spoken about that are on the introverted scale that aren't necessarily um the, on i guess more flamboyant um of those do you think that from a social media perspective that their interests other than racing become super important then so yeah. whether they're into scuba diving whether it's skydiving reading the stock market um does that suddenly Absolutely. take on a whole heap of different importance yeah i never thought about it before um but that's a really good point it's showing a different side to you isn't it hmm. and it's other things that you're passionate about and if you can talk about it then god yeah you do it and you never know you know what heartstrings that could pull on and if a sponsor sees that you're interested in their area as well and there's a nice crossover god you never know where it could go from there so yeah i think adding a bit a bit of color into the picture like that is, is good i'll send you my email after this <laughs> yeah. there you go so and so with the drivers that you're currently working with now is it purely uh for driver coaching um mindset or is it really when they work with you they're getting that whole um i guess a coach uh, where you are helping them with their social media and you are helping them with their sponsorship um yeah i'd say and stuff like that predominantly it's personal performance you know I've, I'm, I've hit a rough patch i need to get back um i'd say that first um so when i've got a driver it's either i'm with them at the race weekends and there's only about three that i do that with because obviously there's not many weekends left uh th this last weekend was the first one i wasn't away and i think i'm away until october now so it's wow. it's you can only fit so many in basically because they've all got like 10 races each so yeah, yeah it gets a bit busy quickly so everyone else is kind of e-coaching so it'd be like this speaking to them about how was it last weekend um they send me a score sheet like um on their personal performance and that comes through and i'll make a graph and you make it all fancy and we can measure it then and see where you are at and that's always on the personal performance side but when i first sit down with them you sit down for two hours and we go through the driving side basically you know how the braking all the other stuff the normal driving stuff uh on the second page will be mental and this is all on an excel sheet so you go through their best times how they performed their worst times how did they create that then a score sheet of how they are in all these different ways like a psychometric test as such just to know where they're at there um and speak to their team manager or their parents to see their perspective as well so you get like a mental model a driving model then a mental mental model then i go into their work ethic how they spend their hours mm -hmm. 
um and you know how how well do they know the tracks what are they doing what's their lifestyle their environment um and then the marketing side is also quite big in terms of what are you doing what's the reach you've got because obviously where they say i've got a thousand tiktok um subscribers or followers i've got four thousand over here i've got 500 i've got 200 there and you sort of add them all up so you can see your reach because that's obviously quite important for them to know when it comes to sponsorship so they can yeah. price it properly and improve it if it's like jesus i'm not even on instagram um so it's just aware to that so it's really it's the overall one so that gives me a really good snapshot quite mm -hmm. deep but a good snapshot of where they're at and it's like okay what are we struggling with what's the main priorities um and usually it's personal performance the mental and the driving so yeah. i'm there mostly to be fair and then we just go into have you done a post today you know what i mean so it's not i don't really major on the marketing side on that yeah. side um and if they need help on sponsorship it's like okay let's talk about that what do we need to do let's try and get some 500 pound sponsors in even though the space on the car is probably worth 20 grand let's just sell it for 500 give them a good time, <laughs> get yeah. them in the door, let them know that it's a deal. Um, and hopefully they'll sign up for next year. So it's kind of trying to think, okay, what can we do now for that will help you in six months? Um, and if they haven't got the confidence to go and speak to them, it's giving them that and helping them team up with people that have got the confidence to sell. So yeah, it, it's, it is quite wide, but I'd say predominantly um, it comes down to the mental and the driving. And has COVID affected your business over the last 18 months or? It did, it yeah. If, uh, originally it was, there was no racing. So it was like, okay, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> that's quite a big uh, income supply right there, gone. Yeah. Um, and not for income, but I thought, right, let's do some training online now. So mm -hmm. I got a better simulator and, and, um, uh -huh. and we, and I started to train the drivers on, e-coaching and getting into a room together should we say a, a session together it, it, this is all about qualifying then we're going to do a race at the end and it kind of grew over about two weeks and we had about 30 drivers and then, and then i thought okay let's do a championship and i called it the april isolation or isolation yeah. april i can't remember now and started to invite different drivers drivers started to invite different drivers and we got it live streamed and it did really well. And we had Lando Norris and all sorts of people in there, loads of juniors. Um, I think it was 105 drivers that we had to sign wow. up. Yeah. And about 40 to 60 would turn up for a race. And it was really good. It took off. And then I thought, hang on, this is there's no live TV now. Uh, live <laughs> sport on TV. Hmm. So we went to uh, BT Sport and we said, we're doing this. We've got big names in it. Are you interested in putting it on TV live? And they snapped it up. So, so it's like, okay, and we're doing May isolation now. Um, <laughs> so this, this kept us busy for a while. We did two seasons, if you like, the two, yeah. two months worth. Um, and now I just do it once a month, uh, once a year in January. Call it the <laughs> ultimate e-driver now. But yeah, so that, that sort of took up the first few months. And then before July, I think it was, we were, by July, we were back on track. So the Sorry. only thing that hurt is the actual <laughs> traveling. Yeah. Because all the tests you have to do, all the isolations, sure. all the rules, they keep changing. So I think that's the biggest pain. Lots of paperwork now to fly away. Like really? you'll get to the airport and you'll find out you're not allowed to transit through Switzerland because you're from the UK. I'm like, oh, God. So then you have to change your flight. So I think it's all <laughs> things like that that are more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> we wish we had those issues. And so we can't even go interstate at the moment. So it's I know it's got down, right? Yeah, yeah we're, we're like we're like seven different countries at the moment yeah, so, right. like within one big brown land and i mean um belinda's obviously had a, a lot tougher than what i have in terms of the lockdown but yeah. um my city my state has gone into lockdown um just at the weekend and we're there for the, at least the next week if not it'll be longer of course wow but, yeah don't get me started but um, basically yeah we haven't had continued or a whole season of racing since the grand prix last year so oh my goodness. We, we've had yeah. you know we've tried to have the australian karting championships and they only had like three rounds last year this year they can't even hardly get any a lot of the yeah. national series can't run because we can't get people in and out of each state it's actually it's so chaotic over here at the moment and yeah so it was here for a here. long time same it's here <laughs> you're going yeah. well there. 
Well, uh, it's weird because at the minute they said, right, the cases are rising. So what we're going to do, we're going to open up completely. Like, oh, OK, <laughs> that's an interesting yes. way of doing it. <laughs> but well, it, it might work because obviously the vaccine and all that. Um, the death count isn't that bad at the minute. So, yeah, it's still an experiment that we're running. I think it's been quite amazing the experiment. I mean, when you look over um, the Euro, so I tuned into most of the England games during the Euro at Wembley, the yeah. atmosphere I've never... I don't think watched a sporting event where I've seen atmosphere like the the national anthem at yeah. Wembley, and then you go to the the British Grand Prix and how absolutely phenomenal that was in so many ways on Friday and Saturday, then into Sunday. Um, yeah, it was mad. You know, it was just I had goosebumps pretty much the whole weekend watching <laughs> all of that because I do like yeah. a few of your uh, British drivers, um, but uh, yeah, like I had goosebumps watching a lot of that over that weekend and. Um, it's amazing to see that. Also, American sports now that they're they're back open and um, and everything else. It's um, yeah. quite incredible. Yet we're just bumbling from one piece to the other with nine cases here, twenty cases there, sort of deal. Yeah, it's crazy. But the it, it was the day before lockdown that we actually did the Grand Prix, and I went on Friday. I went to Beckett's to watch Liam. Um, and Luffield and I saw went out in the crowd and it's like you're thinking okay one in 60 people because a million people have got COVID at the minute one in 60 have got it so he's probably got it he's probably so I was trying <laughs> to keep away from everyone because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's no masks or anything everyone was just out there getting drunk it was hilarious <laughs> so I was like Easy. yeah it's like walking through the walking deads you know trying to keep away <laughs> easier said than done in a crowd of like 140,000 people yeah it's mad it's a big place anyway. but still and so thank you very much for all of your insights today. I really appreciate your time. And yeah, it was okay. great to hear exactly what you do do and really showcasing to, to drivers that as they do go up through the ranks, that it is just as important, if not more important, to actually have everything um, yeah. you know, aligned. So, you know, the fitness, the nutrition, definitely their mindset, but also knowing their sponsors, knowing what um, social media content they're going to do and, and basically having those confidence to do media training and, and to promote their brand. Yeah. you got to see yourself as a company. You need the product and you need the marketing. It's no different. My whole slogan, Enzo, is motorsport is a business. So oh, everyone that... Every, that's why I keep saying every episode, I'm like, guys, most what is a business, you have to treat it like a business. Yeah. Um, so I'm very passionate about that. Uh, where can people learn more about you and follow your journey and get some tips, tips and strategies of yourself? Well, luckily, my name is that obscure. It's quite easy to find on Google <laughs> search. Uh, but yeah, just the racedrivercoach.com is the website where I base myself. So yeah, any anything on there, and you'll see the social media links from that. Yeah, and I do quite often repost your links into our free Facebook thank group. You. So thank you. Thank um, you. And, yeah, I think, you know, it's just snap information that you do provide. Sometimes they're five minutes um, yeah. of podcasts or YouTube videos. Sometimes they're 15 minutes. And so yeah, you random. Just, and you just go on a rant, and, but it's just black and white, and it's just like you just have to do it. And if you don't do it, then don't turn in next week. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I've got to do today's Driver Coach Show uh, episode after this. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing it on yet. So, so it'll just be press, press play, uh, pro, sorry, press record and let rip. I think it will be on the Grand Prix yesterday, but I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah, it is literally. How yeah, about no the way. fact that you haven't watched the Olympics? <laughs> and yeah, that, maybe. I should do that. That is such an international thing. English aren't going that well. But I guess. <laughs> Once we're we're, we're, we're producing, producing Enzo show here. I mean, no, I think it's pretty, pretty special for you, like with um, – your relationship with Ocon and Vettel, of course, that um, yeah. while they Vettel got disqualified, but finishing on the podium there, and especially Ocon getting his first ever Grand Prix victory and such a fine drive. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty special day and a lot to celebrate for you. It is. Yeah, level, I did text him actually. He's just got back this morning. He's, I think he must have about a thousand messages, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, but yeah, he'll be over the moon. I mean, that just one more thing. He's a kid who. We picked him up uh, in Cartin to pay for his racing, basically, because that's what Gravity did. They funded drivers, which was amazing. There's not many programs like that now. Um, and he was living in the caravan with his dad, and his dad was a second-hand car salesperson. And it's just like the story for you to, for him to go from where he was to where he is now is it just shows people that it is possible nowadays. I mean, Bottas, Hamilton, none of them came from money. There's mm. so many of them that did actually uh, that are in the same boat um and it was because they obviously 
they got the cash to do the first part and they won and then somebody took a shining to them and they met somebody to, who said right i can invest in your career like liam lawson hasn't got the cash on his own you know most of them haven't because it's so expensive you're talking about mm. formula four is quarter of a mil this is pounds now um so double it uh then you've got f3 is a million two million for f2 it's like who's got that cash really huh. there's not many drivers that have so yeah. it's like for all the drivers that are out there that haven't got the money it's just racing anything even if it's mx5s yeah. it only costs you 20 grand a year anything as long as you're winning and you're shouting about it you never know where it can go and that's it so don't think i've got to be in f4 and then you spend the, the the winter trying to get the 300 grand or whatever together for it and you fail so you end up racing nothing it's just no no go and race lawnmowers anything yeah and, and that's, why, that's why i say like everyone in australia doesn't aspire to be a formula one driver they also don't aspire to race the supercars here their, yeah. their goals are at a very different level and people have got to be realistic too about what yeah. they can afford if they want to do the sport so it's either race what you can afford yeah or knuckle down it and this is it like you have to you know yeah. do all those things that we talked about getting sponsors yeah. to social media constantly like it, it's a business it, it's that's yeah. something that you've got to take seriously um and yeah as you know there's lots of things that you can do yeah again and so thank you very much have you got any last words tips or tricks no, I think that was it. Just get <laughs> out and crack and win. Um, yeah, don't aim. I mean, aim high, but obviously you, your first goal should be manageable and just, yeah, get you out there and, and shout as loud as you can. And it takes a long time. I mean, yeah. if you say, right, I wanna, I've want i got a five-year plan. I want to be an F1 or V8 supercars by year five. It's like, that's great. But <laughs> let's, uh, let's just do step one first and see where it goes. Because a lot of the opportunities that come up, they're unforeseeable you know you just meet someone on, on the plane and it happens to be a sponsor you can't really right. give them a template saying this is how you do it and you can yeah. win a championship and end up with nothing it's like verstappen was p3 in f3 straight to f1 um so was against some button it's not like they were the champions all the time so it's not like oh you must win to go up it's opportunities meeting people and having that kind of uh salesmanship that you've got within you to pull it off and talk to everybody that's what i echo into just remember i keep telling them that you guys yeah. are a walking billboard like yeah. doesn't matter who you meet especially when you're sitting on that plane when you're sitting waiting to board the plane when you're at yeah. the shop tell everybody your story to find yeah. your pitch and tell everybody your story because you don't know who they are or who's in relation or what they might be involved in motorsport not involved like you don't know who you're talking to but tell your story and at the yeah. worst case scenario you've got a new fan that will be a new statistic on your social media following exactly <laughs> that's what hamilton did wasn't it with ron dennis so i'm going to win in your car yeah. one day or drive your car one day and he was eight years old 